Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out to attend the Media Vantages webinar on Africa. We hope you find this session insightful. My name is Vinod Tangu, and I handle the African and the Indian media at the Media Vantage. We will be discussing the challenges that Africa is facing during COVID-19 pandemic. We will see how consumer behavior and media consumption habits have changed during this lockdown. The governments have been quick to enforce a lockdown on majority of the African countries, which is a result of their past experience in dealing with such epidemics. In times of crisis, consumer needs changes, which positively impacts some industries, such as medical insurance, healthcare, FMCG, etc., while destroying others. Hence, media plays an important role and marketeers need to innovate to reach their target audience, to maintain their market share. Today, along with our partners, DSTV and Kantar, we would like to share some insights on what is the best way forward to your brand to stay relevant during these challenging times. Allow me to introduce today's panel to you. Firstly, we have Kelvin Story, Principal Media Strategy and Insights, DSTV, we also have Alexis Petche, Senior Media Strategist, East Africa from DSTV. We also have Manasrita Singh, Executive Director, Insights Division from Kantar. Welcome on board. But before we start, I'd like to share the key discussion points for this afternoon. Africa is in a lockdown, which is new normal for consumers. Driving media trends in viewership and how it's going to shape the mix of genre consumption. Renewed respect for what consumer classify as essential items. How communication can fit the moment consumers are currently in. Uh, this session is going to be approximately about an hour. Do feel free to ask any questions using the chat box below. We will try to answer them all if time permits. If not, please feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn, Instagram, or via email. Now, I'd like to call Kelvin to, over to you, Kelvin. Cool, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's session. So I'd like to first start off by obviously just giving an overall context um, of, of, uh, of Africa before we start moving into sort of how COVID has really affected things. So to begin with, Africa is a vast continent with a mixture of cultures, traditions, and economies. With over 2,000 African languages spanning over 54 countries. Key cities to note, Lagos, Nigeria, being the most populous city on the continent. Accra, Ghana, the fastest growing economy on the continent, and Johannesburg, South Africa, the wealthiest city on the continent. Known mainly for the seven key industries being culture, of, of agriculture, banking, consumer goods, infrastructure, mining, oil and gas, and telecommunications. However, the growth of Africa is hardly limited by these extractive industries. The stark reality of Africa is a continent of great divide amongst its consumer segments. According to the UCT Unilever Institute, they classified three key sectors as being upper to middle with a monthly spend of $2,000 and more. Your middle class will spend between $235 to $1,980 a month. And then your working class who spend less than $235 a month. To put this into context, 60% of the population are below the poverty line with the upper class constituting 6% of the population earning over $20 per day. A vast difference and divide is clearly seen as people clamber to make money to support themselves, their families, as well as their extended families. But under these conditions, a new working force has been coming into being, the African entrepreneur. There's been an explosion in investment across Africa, especially within the African tech companies, seeing an increase of over 550% since 2015. If we look at Nigeria and Kenya, they were the continent's top startup investment destinations, 
jointly accounting for 81.5% of investment received in 2019. Nigeria ranked both top for, for both a number of deals being done and for the value of startup investment received, nearly fivefold compared to 2018. Visa has paid over $200 million for a 20% stake in Nigerian payments processor InterSwitch, making it Africa's first fintech unicorn. Just as importantly, new interest in African fintech emerged from China with Opay and PalmPay, two new payment uh, companies in Nigeria, jointly receiving over $210 million in funding, predominantly from Chinese investors. But obviously we've reached this point where an outbreak has occurred. And the coronavirus pandemic was confirmed for spread to Africa on the 14th of February, 2020. The first confirmed case was in Egypt, and the first confirmed case in sub-Saharan Africa was in Nigeria. The identified imported cases have arrived mostly from Europe and the United States, rather than from the likes of China. So when COVID-19 really hit um, African shores, it started off with something not really understood by most, largely because it's unseen, and the vast amount of conflicting stories started surging. However, by March, more and more governments got on board to institute state control to manage the pandemic. 28 declarations of state of emergency, national health emergency, or national disaster in 37 countries has been noted uh, across the continent to date. So with swift action, we have formed ourselves and found ourselves in Africa in lockdown. And yes. it's been commended across the, the board uh, from, from all, most governments, varying levels of implemented social distancing coming in place from country to country. The three key risk factors that really kind of came to the face in Africa immediately was firstly, COVID will cause substantial economic and fiscal challenges, oil and tourism dependent economies especially. The second item being enforced isolation uh, with increased tensions. This economic hardship will obviously impose possible security threats and even affect certain governments as they're approaching their election season. The third point is the positive outcome really across the continent has been the swift movement of the government to impose these lockdown procedures to protect the healthcare systems from, from falling over and being overwhelmed. So the amount of actual cases have been relatively low compared to the rest of the global nation. So the key African stance to COVID has been prevention, is really better than treatment. Unfortunately, we've got to take that bitter economic pill um, right now. And the third one being the associated security symptoms that need to be gambled with. From a media and consumer standpoint point of view, some immediate trends came to light, um, uh, literally overnight. First and foremost, TV in itself ballooned. Um, more live content is being sought out than ever before. Uh, with consumers being home, daytime TV has spiked to levels almost equal to that of the usual prime time time band. Uh, with that, and in conjunction with high levels of social media interactivity of complementing these high levels of, of TV consumption, there may be physical distancing, but socially, consumers have never been so close than ever before. Thirdly, the digital transformation has absolutely accelerated. Digital products have been escalated within firms and the race is on to really digitize. This has been specifically evident across looking at the fintech industries in Africa, in terms of education being available digitally, as well as healthcare sectors, uh, that people that digitally can find out and, and get more information regarding the symptoms. The fourth point is obviously the growing concern around one's financial well-being. You know, where will that next paycheck come from, uh, especially out of the informal industries, which are very cash-based, um, or will it be just a reduced paycheck? There's a certain amount of uncertainty that's, that's growing within the consumer base. And the fifth one is obviously far more sensitivity when it actually comes to physically handling cash. There's this acceleration of the cashless society, knowing the actual origin of the product, where is it actually coming from? And also the sense of hyper-local, largely due to the lockdown, um, but supporting the hyper-local industries so instead of traveling really that extra distance, who can I support within my hyper-local um, environment? So from a DSTV point of view, we've, we've focused on three key regions across the continent, in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, utilize, utilizing our own DSTV, our return path data, just to look at top-line uh, viewership trends, uh, breaking it down by genre. 
since the COVID uh, pandemic has broken out. For the purpose of this exercise, we have compared uh, March 2020 on March 2019. Now, over the next uh, three slides, you'll notice very similar patterns that really come across these environments. And we specifically have chosen quite broken out sort of countries to, to look at that, that change. So first and foremost, to really start off with, if we're looking at Nigeria, a really strong growth in overall viewership has occurred in, in, in Nigeria, with the key genres being general local entertainment, obviously kids, more kids sort of at home, kid movies international, and news, showing respectively over 40% growth. We see this from market to market, the growing shift to more local market consumption of content over the international. Uh, people more sort of aware of wanting to know what is happening locally than actually internationally. While sport is currently hampered uh, by lack of events in the sporting calendar, these audiences haven't just left, they've just simply shifted. And there has been a bit of an uptake in terms of general entertainment local as well as general entertainment international for these sports lovers. Um, and over and above that, in terms of utilizing the sports channels to actually push more male oriented content for the time being. Um, and over and above that, there's been some sort of high levels of repeat viewership of certain games, certain scores that people relish and, and want to know uh, to relive that, that moment. The biggest increases in viewership have been recorded across your news channels. So CNN, for instance, up by 57%. Your movies channels up by 41%. If we look at Kenya, Kenya follows a very similar wave of viewership, large numbers of viewership growth. The biggest increases, once again, from your general entertainment, local, international movies, and your kids' content. Um, once again, looking at sort of news and being up to date with current content, CNN really seeing the biggest in terms of percentage growth of 72% uplift, followed by your movies. But also, interestingly enough, the super sport and WWE has also been pulling in a fair amount of share. If we move into South Africa, there have been four noticeable view shifts in viewership. Firstly, a movement of audience from sport to the general entertainment channels, as I previously referred to. Secondly, a dramatic increase in overall viewership across the platform. Thirdly, a surge in daytime viewership. Ultimately, daytime is the new prime time, um, which has seen a lift, obviously, from viewership, really starting from almost your nine o'clock in the morning and maintaining levels throughout the day. And your fourth one is local content is really the hero and it's driving um, a big proportion of viewership. News has seen the largest increase in viewership. Keeping up to date is absolutely paramount for anyone. So if we look at these three countries, you'll pick up a very similar trend of viewership. There's this heavy lean forward mechanism and lean forward we refer to as seeking advice, which really comes through your news consumption. And then the lean back, which is more the escapism with more general entertainment uh, from a local base. Over and above this, and I've been speaking about our linear um, sort of traditional TV set, we've also looked at DSTV now, which is our uh, over-the-top streaming services. So across the streaming services, and prior to COVID-19, we were really seeing month-to-month -month growth across the DSTV now platform, both in terms of access of live viewership as well as uh, video on demand. Um, we've reached a peak of over 1 million unique users uh, during key periods of the year already, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. So looking at the first three months of 2020, the trend, you can see the noticeable increases, especially coming from the likes of Nigeria, actually, Nigeria and Namibia, um, so Kenya being relatively stable. It is important to note in this graph that currently South Africa does make up 89% of the overall DSTV now traffic across the continent. Mobile access itself, um, in terms of platform is the most widely used um, and access. So it is important to bear in mind the affordability that comes into play as well as sort of Wi-Fi and data access when analyzing the overall growth um, of, of, this, of this market. I'll be handing over now to Alexis who will take you through consumer behavior. Good afternoon, everybody. In a time of crisis, our needs indeed change. Lockdowns have had both a psychological and economic impact on African communities. In the hierarchy of needs, products and services that address self-esteem and self-actualization have been deprioritized. Perhaps one must also consider that each country 
has placed its own measures and each market is presented by its own challenges. Luxuries are less of a focus now, but need, basic needs have become a treasure. The focus in this time when consumers are purchasing goods and services is the following. Is it safe? Does it answer my necessities? What part of the world does it originate from? The advent of the pandemic has re resulted in consumers having found a renewed respect for essentials. So we look at categories and, and analyze what has increased, what has decreased, and what has stayed the same. So categories that have decreased in demand are looking at out of home dining, alcohol, automotive, and travel. In South Africa, for example, the government has formalized essential groceries by legislating what can or cannot be purchased and closed off borders and movement across regions. Categories that have stayed the same, the personal category, personal care category rather, has stayed the same as a day-to-day -day necessity and, and, and remains consistent. Categories that have increased in demand are categories such as telecoms, which have grown as more and more people work from home and use telephony as a way of connecting to the outside world. The FMCG category has seen an increase specifically within the epidemic prevention uh, sector, as well as then giving the importance of health and safety during a, a, a pandemic. Medical insurance and nutritional supplements have seen a growth with products and services being looked at from a quality and efficacy perspective, becoming more the purchase drivers. When we move on, we look at keeping up to date with what is vital. So from a media standpoint, where are audiences sitting? As the need to get to know news as soon as possible and to verify this by checking other online sites, social media has seen the highest increase of 66%. But generally, the combination of digital platforms and TV has seen the greatest surge. Di digital and low touch activities are growing, attracting both new and increased users during the pandemic. Due to the rise in fake news, consumers are turning to both television and digital to verify news sources. So now we look at what time, how time will determine and, and, and the impact on, 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 on countries. So for consumers, um, life will not go back to, this, to, to, to be back to normal. With each lockdown happening by country, ranging from social distancing and curfews as seen in countries like Kenya and Nigeria, to reduce spending in South Africa at its current stage of lockdown. For business, the short to medium term sees an increased shift in e-commerce and a competitive shift to meet new demands, while a prolonged impact may lead to workforce scalability and organizational changes. So the anticipated consumer shifts are, look, are, are as follows. So if you look at an omni-channel approach, the shift in consumer purchasing affects the consumer purchase journey and how media needs to reach them. In bricks and mortar terms, consumers will continue to use digital to short circuit trips to stores that would open them up to exposure to the virus. Now that, than ever before, brands have to adopt an omni-channel approach when trying to reach their target audience. The new essential, the new renewed respect, drives consumers look, to look at what, what will be safe for my family and what is the product's point of origin. At home, we, as seen in Calvin's uh, viewership trends, consumers look to news, general entertainment, and some sporting content on television and OTT platforms while the pandemic remains. So as DSTV, we also have taken this time to, to, to give back to communities. In, in, in looking at um, South Africa, we've opened up key channels across subscri subscription set-top boxes. We've allowed for um, parents who are staying at home with their kids to get a channel where we, we are teaching children from home. 
and over and above, a considerable amount of money has been given to uh, the pandemic across different markets, partnering with different uh, stakeholders like local football teams to just make sure that we weather the storm um, as a brand that gives back to communities. I'm going to hand over to Monacita to give us through what the recovery looks like. Thank you, Alexis. So we've been hearing Kelvin and Alexis talk about a lot of changes that are happening in consumer behavior. We ourselves as consumers are sitting at home. We are all right now, if you look at the situation, we are all attending a webinar from home. It's a different situation. So there are a lot of changes which have happened due to the coronavirus and different countries are at different stages during this journey. But at the same time, the biggest question which marketeers have is that what should brands do at this point in time? How do I respond to this phenomenal amount of change that is happening? Well, from a lot of work on brand and consumers, our learning suggests that don't lose sight of the long term. And why are we saying that? We are saying that because we have seen from past pandemics and outbreaks that there has been a recovery. So there is a period of outbreak which, which exists and the, this time the period could be longer and it varies a lot by countries and by different uh, markets, but recovery that happens. So if you look at- Sorry, Spark, the other Kelvin is not a... or, or Fukushima, you see that a recovery happens and it is seen over a period of time. In fact, in certain markets, you also see after a year or two, a growth also happening. But yes, let's accept that there has been a disruption there is a this, but also there is a hope that recovery will happen. And what we have seen during these periods, so if you look at the 2009 recession, this is the data from Cantor's Branzi study. So for those who don't know, this is a study which is done globally and it, it does brand valuation. So which brands are the strongest brands in the world? We determine this uh, through this piece of work. And you see the, the top yellow band over there. If you see that, this is a representation of the strongest brands. So we see that brands which are strongest tend to recover more quickly and, and grow better than the brands which are not strong. And when we say, when we are talking about the strength of the brand, we mean the equity of the brand, how strong these brands are in the minds of consumers. So it's very important for the brands to stay strong. And we know that salience is a big driver of this equity. There are other components as well, but salience is very important. And especially, very important in the times of crisis, because during a crisis, we do not spend time choosing between brands. We, we as consumers tend to pick the familiar trusted brands. We do not want to try the unknown because there are, as it is, it, it's, it's a time of familiarity and you tend to switch towards familiar brands. And we know that advertising is a big component that helps in driving salience of brands. But at this point in time, with so much of disruption and this, marketers are asking this question that, should I continue or stop my media investments? I understand that sales is important, but what do I do? Uh, should I, uh, so some of the marketers have actually paused their spends. Some have spread it across different media and said that, okay, people are home, let me spend more on digital or should I continue on TV? So these are all questions and genuine questions which marketers are asking. So the biggest one is, should I pause for a while or should I continue the way I was spending? And from all the brand health tracking work that we have done over years at, at Kantar, uh, our learning suggests that the price of going dark can, for long can be brutal. Because over a period of time, you build on certain brand health measures like your awareness, your brand image, your equity. And if you're not on air, if you're not talking to, to the consumers, they start to fall off. And once they start to decline, once the decline sets in, it's very, very difficult for the brands to revive and it takes more than double the effort to bring it back to where it was. So at this point in time, if you're looking for an advice, you should not stop advertising. Consumers are still consuming brands. They are still consuming these brands, even if they're at home and there is an opportunity to talk to them. So do not stop advertising. The other big question is, oh, everybody is on digital media. Should we shift there? If you, if you, if you just saw what uh, Kelvin presented and you see the TV viewership has gone up, Yes, the context could have changed. I, I'm consuming general entertainment as well as I'm consuming a lot more news. But yes, I'm there on TV as well as digital. So both these channels continue to be very important. The other important point is 
how do I balance and how do I decide how, how I spread my media investments? And for this, we suggest that there has to be uh, learnings and one has to invest in seeing how your media plays out for your brand. What are the synergies that happen? How does TV work with online video for you? How does TV and social media work? From all our work and our learnings across our cross-media studies that we do, we have seen that TV and social media have a strong synergy and so do TV and online video. When we talk about the synergy, it is the kind of impact that they're creating together in the minds of consumers. In fact, we have also quantified that if you get the right mix, you can get an additional 24% of the impact rather than having and continuing without knowing and if you just go with a plain usual mix. If you optimize the investments, you can get 24% additional ROI. The other important point is that customize your content according to the uh, platform or the context that you're playing in. Uh -huh. Seen? We have seen when you customize a digital, uh, customize a TV, uh, um, TV ad to the digital platform, you actually tend to see 67% more impact. So a powerful, uh, powerful learning there that understanding your media synergies is important, understanding role of each media for your brand is important, and then you should look at optimizing your media investments. So this is about media. The other big question right now is what type of content should I be airing? Uh, should I uh, show empathy? Should I just talk and uh, show support to people? Or should I just continue with my regular content? Now on this, we have some uh, ideas and advice here for marketeers. The first one is, uh, well, there is no blanket rule. It really depends on the category and the brand and your uh, market context. The most important thing is that you need to stay critical to who you are. So if as an IKEA, I am, I'm talking about providing that nice home to people where people can enjoy with each other. I need to stay true to that. I cannot be communicating something else at this point in time. If you change your direction a lot from what you stand for, you may be seen as somebody who's taking advantage of the situation or somebody who's really shallow. So do not try to do that. Stay true to your core, what you stand for. And how can you do that? In this time, it is important to suspend product advertising and look towards providing emotional support. So we have seen that there's a lot of uh, uh, people are concerned about health, hygiene, economic concerns. So how can you do that? You can provide emotional support in various ways. First is reassurance. Uh, the concern regarding hygiene and safety is so high. It's immense across geographies, across markets. Brands like Papa John's have actually introduced a confidence seal on their pack. So whenever you get a pizza from Papa John's, you see a confidence seal. A simple, a simple small thing, but it does act subliminally in, ensure, in assuring people that yes, this product has been, or this item has been handled with utmost care. Uh, we have seen a lot of pharmacies in Middle East and in other markets also starting contactless delivery, a lot of food delivery happening contactless. And these are some nice gestures and nice things to talk and reassuring consumers that you are safe too, uh, you, uh, that you are safe. The other could be also providing guidance, advice, and tips because people do have a lot of doubts and a lot of concerns. A very simple thing like washing hands. So I, I think none of us as consumers ever bothered to say that, okay, we wash our hands. Nobody times it, right? And uh, there was a, a big thing that, no, you need to wash it for at least half, half, a, set, half, a, half a minute or for one minute. So what is right? So Dettol in India, um, from Rekit Benkiza, they did a wonderful series of ads. They're all home shot films where it was about a mother and child interaction. And the mother says that you can wash your hands with any soap, not saying that wash with Dettol, but any soap for at least 20 seconds a nice social messaging and clearing doubts which people have in this point of time. So a nice way of providing guidance. Addressing financial concerns, well, we all know and we are all worried uh, about the economic impact uh, which is uh, happening or going to happen as a result of this. Addressing those financial concerns, Ford Motors and automobile, because automobile has suddenly become quiet that, oh, this is not the time for us to advertise. But Ford has come out with a very nice scheme saying Ford credit support. It is credit support for people uh, who, who have been affected by uh, the COVID economically, and they're extending the credit period for the people. They are giving them various other options to balance the credit, uh, elongating the EMI options and doing a whole lot of things. So a, a, an excellent example of providing the right support at the right time. And it's not all about addressing concerns. It's also people are locked at home. 
how can you delight your customers? Amazon, Amazon releasing or making their Amazon Audible uh, books uh, free of charge was an excellent initiative. People were so thrilled to have the Amazon audio big books all available for free. And while it delighted the existing customers, it also made the new customers who were sitting at the fence whether to subscribe or not, it also made them try the, uh, try the offering and they may be with it. So an excellent initiative by Amazon. Another nice one was from Disney Plus who slated the release of Frozen 2 two months earlier than what it was anticipated. And parents were just so happy that yes, we are locked down, our kids need new content and Frozen 2 coming, we are very happy. Thank you, Disney Plus. So social media was buzzing with positive comments for Disney Plus for doing this. So there are different ways in which you can provide emotional support. Yeah, and it's important to think of those and, and also think who as brand you are and how can you address that. So Dittol talking about the 20 minutes, 20 seconds hand washing is an excellent fit because the brand has been about it. Papa John saying, uh, giving a confidence seat is again a great initiative. Be mindful of the categories you spend on. Yes, there may be some categories. So if sanitizers are running out of shelf and if I go on advertising sanitizers, maybe it's time to just take a pause and just think about it. Uh, at the same time, a lot of people are also saying that we should not uh, advertise travel or tourism or airlines. But let's, let's not forget that yes, you should not advertise at this time for certain categories for driving sales, but the brand building can still be done. Look at some excellent examples. One is from Russian airline where they said that we are giving 100 miles for free to people for staying home. Imagine an airline saying that you please stay at home, don't travel and I'm giving you miles free. An excellent example of how brand building can still be done in these times. Or for that matter, Louis Vuitton uh, uh, closing, uh, they knew that the perfume sales is going to un undergo this. They converted their factory into a sanitizer factory. Again, a great initiative. People will always look up to this brand for doing the great thing for the society. So you brand building can still be done. It's not all about purchase. And also ensuring being sensitive to the context around. So KFC had an ad on uh, finger licking uh, tasty burger. And in, in, in times like now where touch and licking, I think it would not be seen as a great thing. And they pulled it out very early on when the outbreak started. So the brand was responsive about uh, how they responded to the situation. Uh, Cadbury's had an Easter egg hunt ad, which had grandparents meeting the kids. And especially in UK at the time when elderly were advised not to come out. So they also pulled out this ad early on. So acting at the right time is also important. McDonald's, on the other hand, tried distancing the logo as in promoting that on social media. But unfortunately, it landed, uh, it did not land well because there were other news of McDonald's not being okay with their employees, et cetera. And it almost backfired saying, you're trying these gimmicks on social media saying how social distancing is important, but you're not treating your people well and it backlashed. So don't be gimmicky, stay true to what you are and understand consumers in these times. So while we have seen how one can uh, respond to a Corona kind of content, the other key thing is that not everything needs to be aligned to the Corona situation. We are seeing a lot of ads, a lot of news around Corona. People also need a break. And we have seen from our research and a lot of studies that advertising is still consumed in a similar way as before. So people are not responding to ads in a different way. They're still receiving it in the same way. You can see the results here of a study which we did pre-COVID and during COVID. Also, it gives a sense of normality and a, dis a distraction and escape from the excessive topical content. Come on, you cannot watch, go on watching the news for a long time, so you do switch to a movie. So it's an escape or a break also that advertising provides. In fact, one of our uh, COVID barometer studies, we see that globally, it's only 8% of consumers who said that we don't want advertising at this time, rest all were open to advertising. So these are some learnings about how media and advertising can play in today's time. And I want to leave you with these key learnings. First, of course, stay true to your core, the brand that you stand for, what do you stand for? Don't stop advertising, it's important. Everything, it, while uh, consumers are still consuming brands, they're still using things, and also, if it is a category where it is not selling right now, but it's you brand building can still be done. While t digital is important, focus on TV as well. The TV consumption across the world has gone up significantly. Optimize your investments, understand how various channels are playing with each other. And in terms of content, balance between the topical and the branded content. Okay, over to you Vinod. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manasvita. And also Kelvin and Alexis. Uh, we have a few questions uh, that have come through this evening. Uh, firstly, we have a question from one of our attendees, uh, which is about VOD. Uh, the question goes like this. Uh, I think this is to Kelvin. There is an interesting increase coming from LSM and SCM with the drive of local content it's and it's broadening the base and people utilize VOD. Um, so what is your answer? Is there a big increase in digital consumption drive or? Yeah, so, so I think uh, there, there are probably two, two, two questions in that. I mean, the one obviously with, with VOD, um, there's so many classifications of VOD. So VOD, video on demand. And if you think of, um, how you access VOD, you have SVOD, which is obviously subscription video on demand. So those are your typical players at the moment, like Showmax, uh, like uh, uh, the likes of Netflix. They don't necessarily are accessing any advertising at this moment in time, but they are subscription video on demand. Then you've got your BVOD, which is broadcast video on demand. And those are typically, uh, from our point of view, from a DSTV point of view, that's our catch up world. Um, with sort of people are, are, are learning, are going into the box and actually pulling out specific content um, seen as, as BBOD. TBOD is transactional video on demand and that's for a purchase. So from a DSTV platform point of view, you'd be purchasing movies via box office or it's, or it's, it's any form of, of transaction that you have to pay to get that content. Um, Google Play, for instance, if you want to watch a specific movie, there has to be a transaction. And then the other one is ABOD, which is, I think, later in the year going to be quite an interesting space. So that's basically sort of advertising funded video on demand. So ultimately, the user can have free access to it, but then they have to be open to the advertising that's going to come on board. So from our point of view, we'll be launching that later in the year, ABOD service via Showmax. Um, and then over and above that, then you've got OTT, so over the top. So and over the top in our world is really the streaming services from DSTV now. So what is interesting if you then pull it then into the kind of the second part of the question of digital and, and, and uh, you know, what grouping or LSM is it coming into? Obviously the big thing is you've got to have the money for the data. Um, I think sort of luckily, you know, across most countries in Africa, data actually isn't that expensive. However, I think having access to video on demand that people can specifically go in and get uh, the, the content they want without kind of streaming and looking for it it does help that they almost have this appointment data viewership. You know, they, they align their data needs according to what they want to actually view. So VOD actually gives them that access to it. Whereas then on the opposite side, you've got the live streaming, it needs a large amount of bandwidth. So you are seeing more of a sort of a higher, a more top end market coming into play. But over, it's not necessarily limited to that. It's a lot more sort of middle, middle market to, to, to top end market that comes into play, depending on what VOD service you are actually running with and, and offering. Uh, but for us, from a catch-up point of view, there, there we have seen really vast amounts of, of volume coming in. Um, I think people, you know, it's one of those, they're time poor. It's always a sort of an age-old saying, time poor. So it's at the end of the day coming in and, you know, you do want to watch your specific show and enjoy your own time, which is quite, quite great. And yeah, a great, a great opportunity for all viewers. Thanks a lot, uh, Kelvin, for your answer. Uh, we have another uh, question uh, from one of the attendees uh, to Manaswita. Why should brands advertise now as they may not be getting return on their investment? Okay, that's a very good question. And I think I covered it briefly, but uh, it's good to discuss that because uh, see ROI, typically we tend to measure it only in terms of short-term sales uplift. Yeah, most of the market is limited to that. But in ROI, there's also a big component of brand. What is the long-term effect that is happening, right? So from our learnings, we have seen if you don't advertise for a significant period of time, your brand health starts suffering. And building that brand equity takes longer and much more continued efforts. So when we talk of ROI, people just tend to look at it as sales effect. But you need to look at longer, considering the brand part as well. Also, one more thing to add that while we are thinking that I'm not getting the ROI, we also need to accept for certain categories. Say 
travel right now might not be getting the purchases, but for all the other categories or, you know, larger categories like FMCG and others, consumption is still happening. In fact, consumption for certain categories, like in Middle East, we are seeing that snacks has gone up because people are at home, the entire family is at home and people are actually picking up chips packet and being at home. So consumption of certain categories has gone up. So it's not that you're not getting the ROI. So you need to be salient if a person is picking up a pack of chips. Yeah. Thanks, Manasvita. We also have another question. This is uh, from uh, Rahul Datta. He's asking, uh, does Kantar cover only uh, Africa or do they cover uh, Saudi Arabia and MENA as a large? So uh, we, we have actually, we have a global presence. So we are there across. From UAE, we work in the Middle East markets and also for some Africa markets. So we are there. We are, in fact, we do ex work extensively in Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. We have another question. I think this is this one's for Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin, uh, do you think uh, the subscriber base due to COVID uh, in uh, would increase for DSTV uh, during this period, or how do you? Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I can't. We can't obviously disclose our exact numbers at this moment in time. Uh, uh, excuse the pun, we're in lockdown because um, obviously our financial year ended in March, so it's, it's currently going to board. But yes, um, I think, uh, so driving up lockdown, we, we actually see, saw quite a, a high, high increase of uh, subscribers coming in, new as well as those actually uh, increasing their, their bouquet, um, so moving up levels. So was a, there was a, a combination uh, coming in there. Um, so it, it's definitely driven it up. I mean, if you look at it sort of, uh, you know, Consumers or viewers, their they, their media choices at the moment are, are hemmed in. Uh, you know, TV is is really the family partner right now, um, and and obviously it start for content across anything. So we have seen quite quite a, a big jump in in subscriber numbers uh, from the beginning of March uh, already. So and that's and when I say subscriber numbers, obviously that's from set top box uh, point of view. But at the same time, also in, from our streaming services, um, we've already been reaching peaks of, of literally over two, two million um, sort of views in terms of traffic uh, coming through and unique uh, from our DSTV Now uh, platform as well. So um, yeah, depending on what news outbreaks are occurring at the time. That's great. We also have another question come up. I think uh, this is for Manuswita. Uh, this is from Don. Um, how do you connect your offline media to online or is there or yeah so so that's a so uh, i think the important thing to understand here is the kind of work which canta does is all consumer side of story so from media so if we are you know we are talking in a media world so media agencies or media partners usually the numbers that you get from them are the delivery numbers with these many people we have reached we measure the impact of that reach so if you've reached so many people, what has happened to the awareness? Has the awareness increased or not? So when you're looking at from the consumer side, you look at any media that they're consuming, offline, online, anything. So it comes from the consumer and then you measure the impact. Okay, there's another question from- If there is more well, details required on that, I'll be happy to take it over a mail. And yeah, connect. please. Uh, I think if uh, the attendees think, would uh, like to ask more questions, yeah. please feel free to email us or get yeah. uh, your answers on uh, LinkedIn or our Instagram as yeah. well. There, there is an interesting question from uh, Botswana uh, where uh, the gentleman is saying that there is no data in this market. Uh, so how, how can we uh, use the data from other markets and uh, inform our clients that they need to advertise during uh, COVID? That's, that's the question. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in there. I think for, from our side, you know, we, we always look at the combination between we call archive data, which is typically your, your panel-based data or um, in terms of uh, qualitative, quantitative data, so archive data, but we, then we also look at what the live data is. Um, and live data is on the go. So for us, I think it's a fortunate position. So from the DSTV point of view, yes, we don't have a panel in Botswana at the moment. We do broadcast in Botswana, but we can pick up sort of data usage via our streaming services. So DSTV now gives us a, an, a, an indication of content that's being viewed, channels that are being viewed, because that's, that's obviously, it's, it's live data, it doesn't really matter. And over and above that, then also tapping into our social media channels. Each channel on, on the platform has its own social media presence. 
So we also go and we analyze those target markets within those social uh, media platforms uh, to profile them. Um, so, so to a certain degree, we, we depending on per market or per country, which one is sort of stronger. I mean, live in the day will always be the strongest because it's live now. Um, but then we, we look at that sweet balance, sweet spot between archive and live data and retrofit either way. So yeah, sort of the, the, it, there is a possibility. Where there's a will, there's a way. All right. I hope that answers uh, the gentleman's question. Uh, there is another one. Uh, I'm going to take uh, another two more questions uh, uh, from the participants or the attendees. There's one question that's uh, come up. This is for Calvin. Um, the, they're asking, um, is DST TV OTT offering, how does it compare to its competitors? So I think the big difference for us is for OTT is um, it's live broadcast. Whereas, whereas the likes of, uh, you know, the other competitors out there, you know, that's not, they don't do live broadcast. That's just content that's la loaded onto the slate and then people go into it based on the specific genres they're after. Whereas from our point of view, we've got live broadcasts that, ca that come into play, you know, news on the fly. Um, yes, and then there's a mixture of, of movies. So, um, I think, you know, for our point of view, it's, they're all complementing each other. And you've got to look at this when you're kind of approaching a TV advertising point of view. You've got to actually come, come to it with a video point of view. Um, the consumer will find that content and they're keen in certain genres. It's, it's, it's basically, and that's why we broaden up our platform. So you can view our content across many aspects. You've got the SWOT service with Showmax. You've got the streaming OTT service with DSTV Now. You've got the subscriber set top box service. So they're going to find that content. Um, so, but, uh, the, but basically, so the summary of that, the key point for us is we've got the live content. That's the big, uh, I think, our big play when you're kind of comparing it to the other OTT players at the moment. All right. Thanks, uh, Kelvin. Uh, I'll take this last question from uh, one of our attendees. Uh, uh, it's talking, it's to Manaswita. So it's talking about there's so much pain that's happening in the world right now. I mean, there's so much of negative news. There is so much of, uh, uh, you know, uh, bad TV that's happening. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, why should they uh, advertise right now? Uh, you know, why should they advertise their brand among, you know, this negative uh, publicity, whether it's on television or on digital or anywhere? Well, I think uh, the answer to this is uh, very, uh, it's an interesting question because we do feel that there's a lot of negativity and people are feeling generally very sad and concerned and uncertain. But at the same time, if we reflect on ourselves as consumers, so what are we doing? We are checking on news as well as we are watching movies. And, 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 that's, the, and that's the space. So it's not to say that, uh, you know, you cannot advertise. At the same time, people are seeking inter entertainment they are consuming, they're in fact making more fancy foods than ever. So at one side, we are indulging ourselves. At one time, we are catching up news. So, hence, so while pain is there, there's also a distraction that is needed. So one, there is a space for advertising. One can advertise. Also, consumption has not gone down. As I was saying earlier, there are certain categories which have moved up on consumption. So brands need to be present in that space and hence the need to keep advertising. Okay. Uh... There are quite a few questions coming in and lots of people thanking, uh, you know, the panelists for uh, such an insightful uh, webinar. I think uh, they, they found it very interesting. So uh, there, there is one question that's again uh, uh, come up here uh, about media mix. What is the recommendation for media buying across various formats like TV, online, social, print, etc.? That's a that's a question by one of the attendees. Sure. So uh, I, I think it's maybe I spoke about the media mix. It's then for me. So uh, uh, the answer to this is depends on the category uh, context and the brand that you are playing in because. For certain brands, maybe certain media work or, or the kind of campaigns you do, certain mix works better than the other mix. So, and, for it, and it's all specific to the campaign that you're doing. So you need to measure it for that camp and over a period of time, how and you learn from it that how it works for your brands. In certain cases with, where we see social has a very high impact. In certain cases, we, we see that 
TV continues to have a very big impact. So it, it's a mix. There is no, you know, one answer. It depends on the brand and campaign specific. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Manasrita. We have one last question uh, to Kelvin. How big is BVOD in ROA? In yes. West Africa. Yes. Um, so, so, so obviously um, for broadcast video on demand, it's our, our catch up service. Uh, it is it is focused at more the uh, the top end of, of our, our uh, subscriber base. Uh, you've got sort of the premium subscribers um, and also have the Explorer units. So base wise, I can't give the exact numbers, but if you're really looking sort of the top end, it's 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 uh, it, it constitutes uh, roughly about twenty percent of the overall base. If you look at within South Africa, for rest of Africa, you're looking at about ten percent of of the total subscriber base. All right, thanks, Kelvin. One last question, uh, again, from a gentleman from uh, Botswana to Manuswita. Uh, what kind of content may we suggest to clients who want to advertise, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, concerning COVID-19? I mean, what is the message that uh, an advertiser should, should do is the question. So as we were seeing, there are different ways. So I don't know the category or the client that you're referring to, but it, it will depend, of course, on the brand. So if you are, if you're a brand versus this, uh, but uh, so our overall take on this is that yes, uh, if you if you don't want to advert, I mean, not necessarily everything has to be Corona specific. So you can stay true to what you are. People are still. Uh, it's not to say that people are not watching movies where there are a lot of people. You know, people are watching anything like that, right? So it's not, and we have seen that ads are respond. People are responding to the ads in similar ways. So if you are already you are a brand, you are communicating in a certain way. You don't need to change, unless you have a very specific things which can be like you are not using gloves and you are you know uh, operating somewhere. If you are showing something which is absolutely insensitive to the situation, then don't. Otherwise, rest it's fine. So otherwise, anything which you know may put off people in the current situation, everything else is fine. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Manaswita. With that, we'd like to end this uh, webinar. I think it's been very interesting and very insightful. Thank you for all the attendees who've uh, attended this webinar. Uh, we would have more uh, uh, in the coming months. Uh, thank you so much. And if you do have any more questions, please shoot it out to uh, on our LinkedIn or on our Instagram or via our emails. Uh, thanks again and have a lovely day.